Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we are delving back into French history for a truly fascinating case that took place in the late 18th century. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Professor Singal for providing the script for today's story. You will already have noticed a different voice starting today's video. Her knowledge and attention to detail are truly exceptional, and I believe that you are all in for a real treat with this story today. Our story begins on the night of April the 27th, 1796. At that time in France, the French Republican had their own calendar, commonly called the French Revolutionary Calendar, so the dates in that book are referred to as the 8th to 9th Floréal of Year 4. A mail coach was ambushed. Inside the carriage, it was carrying coins and banknotes with a value of approximately 7 million French pounds. The mail coach was delivering the money to General Bonaparte's Revolutionary Army in Italy and was attacked just before reaching the third stop in Moulin, which is between Paris and Fontainebleau. As you will probably know, General Bonaparte would later become Emperor Napoleon I of France. The mail coaches at the time were light, uncomfortable, but fast, and they would stop at regular intervals to change horses. One passenger could travel along, as was the case on that night, when one of the future murderers boarded the coach in Paris. This case has paradoxically gone down in French history both as a perfect example of a very efficient investigation, especially considering the absence at that time of such routine elements of today's investigations such as fingerprints and photographs, and also as a possible terrible miscarriage of justice for one of the defendants whose case is still debated to this day. On the morning of April 28, 1796, the coach was found emptied of all its valuables by a worried employee who had been sent to investigate why the coach had still not arrived. The two mail coach employees, the driver, Etienne Audubert, and the man in charge of the money, Jean-Joseph Excoffon, were found murdered. They had been attacked on a bridge, and their bodies were found by a small river called Valory. The pictures you can see at the moment are of today's view of that small river. One of the horses had been stolen, presumably by the missing passenger, a man called Laborde, according to the travelling manifesto, and the other horses were tied to a tree. Part of the sabre used to murder one of the men was found, along with a silver spur that had been hastily repaired with a piece of string. Both of the victims were buried in the nearby cemetery of Versailles-Denis, but their graves were subsequently lost when the cemetery was later moved away from the church. A former inn, which is now a Portuguese restaurant, stands at the place where the murder was committed and is still called A l'attaque de Courier de Lyon, with pictures representing the attack on the front of the building. A Moulin Justice of the Peace, Judge Beau, started a very thorough investigation which is still a model of the genre, especially at the time. The crime scene was immediately frozen and investigated. Then investigators were sent to follow the route of the coach. At a Montgeron inn called Le Chasse, the innkeepers described four men, including a blonde one with silver spurs, who had requested a piece of string to repair one of them. All the men were armed with swords or sabres, which was unsurprising or normal at the time, since the roads were not safe. The four men had then moved on to the nearby cafe to play billiards. More witnesses who could recognise these men were also found. Later, further down the Paris to Moulin Road in Lucin, the men spent some time at a bar and, once they had left, two more men followed. These two men left hastily after the bar owner, Monsieur Shampoo, asked them if they were with the four others. Within a few hours, Judge Bowl had a very good description of the four men who were suspected of being the criminals, along with a description of their horses. The third horse that had drawn the mail coach was later found in Paris. 
All of the horse dealers in the city were interrogated until one recognised the descriptions of the four horses of the four criminals. He identified the person who had asked him to let the horses rest at his place as Etienne Curiel. Etienne Curiel had been staying with Joseph Richard on the Rue de la Boucherie in Paris. This street is now well known by English-speaking visitors to Paris as it is the location of the famous Shakespeare and Company bookstore. Etienne and his common-law wife, Madeleine Brebun, had fled to Chateau Thierry two days after the attack. The case was then assigned to a parish judge, Judge Antoine Grégoire d'Aubenton, who had Etienne and Madeleine arrested. One million French pounds worth of the stolen banknotes were found with Etienne. One of Etienne's friends, Charles Guinot, asked if he could ride back to Paris with the investigators. Soon after the man Etienne had been staying with in Paris, Joseph Richard and Joseph's wife were also arrested. The two men were later charged with the murders, but their wives were released. The owner of the horses, a man called David Bernard, was also arrested, along with his valet, Antoine Brewer. Until recently, David had been fairly poor, but the investigators found three million pounds worth of alcohol ready to be sold at his place. Etienne's friend, Charles Guino, was asked to go back to the tribunal to testify and get his travelling papers back. On his way to court, he convinced one of his friends, Joseph Le Cerf, to join him. However, also waiting for Judge Daubenton at the court were the witnesses from Montgeron and Lucin, who recognised Joseph Le Cerf as being the blonde man with the silver spurs, as well as recognising Charles Guinot and Etienne Curiel. They requested to be heard immediately. Since Charles Guinot was a friend of Etienne and Joseph Lesseur had been a guest of Etienne in Paris at Joseph Richard's Rue de la Boucherie address, Judge Dorbenton had them both arrested and charged with murder. Joseph Lesseur was a man who had grown rich during the revolution by using his wife's dowry to buy nationalised properties that used to belong either to the clergy or to the nobles who had fled abroad. He came from Doe in the north of France, where his wife and children were still residing, while he was preparing a home for them in Paris. However, his spending habits had put a strain on his purse, and he needed to find new sources of income. The attack of the mail coach to appropriate state money could have been considered as easy money, whilst not stealing someone's private property as the money belonged to the state. During the trial, several witnesses came forward to say that they had seen Joseph Le Cerf on the day of the murder in Paris. His mistress, who was confused by the new revolutionary calendar and was therefore unclear on the dates, and Le Grand, a jeweller at what used to be, and is now again, the Palais Royal. However, it was found that the ledger that was supposed to prove Joseph Le Cerf's presence in Paris had been modified and Le Grand was accused of being a false witness of tampering with evidence and he was arrested. In the end, Charles Guinot was acquitted because a policeman testified that he had been with Charles on the evening of the murder. Antoine Brewer was also acquitted, as it was thought he probably had no idea what his master, the owner of the horses, David Bernard, had been up to. Joseph Richard was sent to penal servitude, but Etienne Curiel, David Bernard and Joseph Le Cerf were all sentenced to death. At that moment of the verdict and sentence, Etienne started screaming that he himself was guilty, but David Bernard and Joseph Le Cerf were not. Etienne said that the culprits were actually André de Bosque, Pierre Vidal and the passenger on the mail coach manifesto, Laborde. However, this did not change anything and Etienne Curiel, David Bernard and Joseph Le Cerf were guillotined on October 3rd, 1796, less than six months after the double murder. Judge de Benton was unable to prevent the execution of the two men, but, along with Joseph Le Cerf's family, took it upon himself to rehabilitate Le Cerf's memory. Laborde was later found under the identity of Joseph Durachet at the Santa Pelagie prison. 
He confessed to the crime in detail, admitting he had stabbed Jean-Joseph Excoffon with his dagger, while others attacked the coach and killed the driver, including Louis Roussy, who had broken his sabre in the scuffle. Roussy, who was an Italian by the name of Bartoldi, was arrested in Spain and, after denying the facts, confessed to a priest and stated that Joseph Le Sir had been innocent. Pierre Vidal was later arrested and sentenced to death. When André de Bosque was finally arrested in 1800, he was not blonde, but was in the habit of wearing a blonde wig. However, he did not look at all like Joseph Le Cirque, and all but one witness, who said she had made a mistake, confirmed their original testimony that Joseph Le Cirque had been the blonde man in Montgeron and Luçon. However, André de Bosque was sentenced to death based on the testimonies of his accomplices and executed. He was, however, considered by the court only as an accomplice and Joseph Le Cirque's name was not officially cleared. There is still debate as to whether or not, as Judge de Bonton himself thought, Joseph Le Cirque had been the victim of a miscarriage of justice. This is when Art stepped in and, in plays and movies, both Joseph Le Cirque and André de Bosque were played by one actor to drive in the idea of mistaken identity and to stress the idea that human testimony is but feeble evidence. A play called Le Courier de Lyon by Eugène Moreau, Paul Cyridin and Alfred Delacour on the subject was produced in Paris in 1850 and, four years later, the case inspired another play, this time in English, by Charles Reed called The Courier of Lyon, specifically written for a famous actor called Charles Keane. A revised version was later played by Henry Irving. In 1953, Marcel Dubois wrote yet another play on the subject called L'Affaire du Courrier de Lyon. The use of one actor to play both Le Cirque and André de Bosque was also at the centre of Maurice Lehman and Claude Autant Lara's movie. This may be why a lot of people are convinced that Joseph Le Cirque was innocent. Following the 19th century theories stating that Joseph Le Cirque had been innocent, a law was passed in 1867 that allowed rehabilitation of convicts. However, Joseph's name was never cleared as André de Bosque was only convicted as an accomplice and Joseph is still officially considered as guilty even if 19th century people tended to think he was innocent. Later on the situation seemed to be less clear cut as more and more serious historians started perusing the available elements of the investigation. In 1963, a very popular TV show called La Camera Explore Le Temps, or Camera Explores Time, presented a movie followed by a debate on the possibility that Le Cirque's case might have been a miscarriage of justice. As is common with these types of shows, the three presenters, Stelio Lorenzi, André Castello and Alain Ducot, had very different opinions on the subject. Another similar show on the same subject was broadcast in 1985 in Le Dossier de Alain Ducou. De Cole's theory was that Joseph Le Cirque and Charles Guino were both involved but had no notion anyone would be killed and were not present at the moment of the attack. They were backups nearby who had financed the attack, which would explain why the killers would consider them as innocent of the two murders. According to Decoe's theory, the two could have been the two men Champoux described as having arrived at his bar after the departure of the first team of four men. In 2011, Eric Danico, a gendarme with a PhD in history who was then stationed in Moulin as director of the Gendarme Museum, wrote a book called L'Affaire de Courrier de Lyon à Jordoui to explain his conviction that Joseph Le Cirque, along with David Bernard, was in fact the organiser of the whole attack, even if he might not have been present when it was actually carried out. He also sadly noted that, notwithstanding the fact Joseph Le Cirque could be guilty, the town of Versant-Denis has given his name to one of its streets, while the victims' graves have been lost and their names seem to have been all but forgotten. So what do you think? Was Joseph Le Cirque guilty or innocent? 
in 2022, 226 years after the fact, we will never know for certain what happened that night and who was ultimately responsible. But let's remember the victims, Etienne Audibert and Jean-Joseph Excoffon, whose names have been forgotten by history. My thanks once again to Delphine Singal for the story. If you ever feel like writing a story for me, I'll be happy to see if I can feature it one time. Please let me know. This is the oldest story I've ever covered. I'll be back to my normal cases next week. Please remember to go visit Delphine Singal's YouTube page. There's some lovely singing to listen to as well on her page. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Au revoir. Goodbye.